Um, I've written here, just to begin, it's funny really to think that um, the day of the Lord, which is what this course is called, the day of the Lord has been in God's mind since before he created the universe. I mean, don't you think that's odd? It's really odd that he created the world knowing that the day of the Lord would be necessary and um, created the universe knowing that it would be necessary. And um, because he knew that this is what was going to happen, there are loads and loads of details about the day of the Lord from the beginning of the Bible, which I, th I find amazing, absolutely amazing. For example, really early in scripture, we get the, um, the account of Babylon, not called Babylon when we first read, but um, the account of Babylon as the source of all other religion, all other religion that has come since that day, and some we recognize, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Islam, um, others not so clearly as religions, but humanism and atheism, and, and then of course all the mixes that we have, all the new age stuff that gets you know, put together, a bit of this and a bit of that, we'll mix it up, and that's another nice way that we'll um, decide our own destiny, we'll go our own way. Um, and all of them really, all of them, have one single uh, guiding principle or guiding decision that people have made, and that is, I'm not going God's way, I'm going my way. And that's the unifying factor between all other religions. I'm not going God's way, I'm going my way. And it's this thumbing the nose, as they say, at God and... Um, and, and very early, as I say, we read about that in Scripture. If you went to Genesis chapter 10, we won't spend any time really there. You can see in Genesis chapter 10 that they, they come off the ark. It's been a long time since the flood, the flood that flooded the world. But they come off the ark. They're told to populate the whole world. But they stay together and they arrive in a place called uh, Babel. They, in a, a, sorry, a place called... Um, um, Anyway, I'll get to the place in a minute. But they get, get to this place and they decide to stay there and to, do, to build a city and in that city to build a tower that will reach to the heavens. Genesis 10 and Genesis 11. And you know already that the word Babel, which is where they stay and where, where they want to build, um, the word Babel means confusion. I think that's so amazing, really, that it means confusion. And uh, we read about that and understand that, of course, that is a very apt description of all the world's religions. They are confusing and deliberately designed to be so. Um, so Babylon became important religiously because it was the centre of, of that religion at that time. They wouldn't have called it a religion, I don't think. They just thought they were going their own way and disobeying God and they would just do what they wanted to do. Um, but it also became very important politically over the years. And um, Nimrod, who founded Babylon, who founded the city, um, actually uh, had a wife called Seramas, who um, founded all the secret religious rites of the Babylonian mystery, mystery or mysterious religions. And um, according to accounts outside of the Bible, she had a son by an alleged miraculous conception and who was given the name Tammuz, T-A-M-M-U-Z. And that, in, in effect, was the false fulfillment of the promise given by God in Genesis to, uh, to Adam and Eve that she would bring forth a son seed that would eventually destroy Satan. Don't you think? I mean, we're only 11 chapters in. I mean, we're 11 chapters into the Bible and we're reading about there's already been a judgment of the whole world by flood. There's already been instructions to those who got off the ark to go and multiply and fill the earth. And there's already been disobedience by all the people who actually were born through those, those uh, ones that got off the ark. And, and it's incredible to me that... We, we don't have to get very far before you see the deception, the counterfeit, which we talked a lot about in the last course, the counterfeit that Satan has put together to lead people astray. And here you have this, um, this uh, promise of God being faked in 
uh, in Nimrod's wife. So uh, various religious practices apparently were uh, connect connected to the false religion, including the recognition of the mother and child, Seramas and Tammuz, as um, this uh, miraculous work of God, this saviour. And from that, they had um, a wild animal restored to life and uh, various other things that happened. And they had this uh, religious prostitution. They built a temple and they had this religious prostitution, which still carries on today, actually, still going today. And through all of the world's empires that have been connected with that area of the world have all had religious prostitutes, religious harlots, religious um, offerings, if you like, of uh, prostitution to a fake god. Um, I find that really interesting in today's world, that the fake counterfeit religions all have this idea of a miraculous birth and of a uh, offering to that God that is physical as well as spiritual. It's a physical offering. Um, the condemnation of that begins in Genesis. The condemnation of those religions begins in Genesis. And it continues throughout scripture. I'm just going to give you some references in Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah and one in Ezekiel. Jeremiah 7 verse 18 says this. Jeremiah 7, 18. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire. This is Jeremiah speaking to Israel. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. In verse uh, 44, um, no, sorry, chapter 44, verse 17, chapter 44, verse 17. But rather, we will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, just as we ourselves, our forefathers, our kings and our princes did in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no misfortune. It's Jeremiah 44, verse uh, 17. But since we stopped burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have met our need by the sword and by famine. Um, our, our, and said the women, when we were burning sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and were pouring out drink offerings to her, was it without our husbands that we made for her sacrificial cakes in her image and poured out drink offerings to her? So Jeremiah is quoting, or the people are coming back to Jeremiah and saying, we're not going to worship our God because he's not doing what we need. He's not bringing us the food that we need, the prosperity that we need. And that's a, a big that's a common factor, isn't it, through scripture? And when we get to our day, that's exactly what we're finding, actually. It's hidden a bit in our day, this, this kind of anger at God is, is hidden, sort of. But it is going to become very much more common because this world is going into the day of the Lord is already in it in some ways, but is going to, it's going to get worse. And as it does, that's going to produce, yes, a lot of confusion and lostness and brokenness and pain and sorrow and suffering, yes, but it will also produce a lot of anger. Anger at God. I think we've already seen the beginnings of it. There's anger at God within the church because we've had all of this confusion, uh, all of this straying away from biblical principles, which has caused confusion, which has divided the church, and which has brought us into a place now where people are angry if you don't agree with them. They're angry if you say, suggest that we stick with biblical principles. There's real anger out there. You have to only go on social media and you can feel it. You can not only read it, but you can feel the anger that's there. People are angry at one another and at God, and at God. And so um, 
I, I, it, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you know that behind the anchor, uh, anger, there's a sort of lostness. There's such confusion and chaos and really a sort of a feeling of betrayal. But, there, but that's coming out and looking like anger. So it's hard for us. It's hard for us because we have to help, try to, or ask the Lord to help us to get behind that, to, to forget the anger, to, to ignore the anger and cut right through to the, which is in a way a confirmation to me of the fact that it's only the word of God, the sword of the spirit that cuts through bone and marrow and all the stuff of life and is able to cut through right to the heart. And so it is the word of God that is going to get through the anger and the pain and the lostness and the suffering and only the word of God. And so again, and you come back to that same heresy, that same false teaching, that the attack is always on to the word of God and to those people who uphold it and want to live by it. Goodness knows what the Anglican church is going to go through now. Goodness knows what they're going to go through because um, we... Uh, sorry, it was just something coming off the Zoom there. Because we're now actually right at the last step, which has already been taken, I think. And the division and the, 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 what's going to come from that is going to be really rather... Horrible, terrifying. So anyway, um, scripture continually, J Jeremiah, I mean, there's a Jeremiah uh, verse 25, sorry, verse f chapter 44, verse 25. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as follows. As for you and your wives, you have spoken with your mouths and fulfilled it with your hands, saying, we will certainly perform our vows that we have vowed to burn sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings to her. Go ahead and confirm your vows and certainly perform your vows. Nevertheless, hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, who are living in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says the Lord, never shall my name be invoked again by the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, as the Lord God lives. Behold, I am watching over them for harm and not for good. And all the men of Judah who are in the land of Egypt will meet their end by the sword and by famine until they are completely gone. This is God's word through Jeremiah to those Jews who have left Judah, gone into Egypt and decided to follow the fake religion and worship the Queen of Heaven. Um, so, uh, and, and throughout scripture you see that as the worship of Baal. It, you just constantly read the worship of Baal throughout scripture. And um, it that takes various forms. And I think in our day, we have been slightly confused and not recognized it as the worship of Baal because it's taken on, it looks, in some places, it looks actually Christian. And it looks like something that's good. When you read scripture and you read about the worship of Baal and you read this, the way God spoke of it, you're under no illusions about whether or not that's what God wants. You see it's totally not, and it's the worship of other idols and other gods. But once it gets mixed into our civilized culture, then it becomes palatable, and then people are encouraged to follow it. Um, the city of Babylon has got a history dating back 3,000 years before Christ. 3,000 years, and, uh, and up and down early history and after a period of decline, I'm reading this from my notes, it rose again under Nebuchadnezzar. It rose again. It, so it declined, it was up and down a little bit, Babylon, but then it came to great prominence under Nebuchadnezzar. And you know, because you've studied the book of Daniel, you know about Nebuchadnezzar and what he did and how God used him to bring judgment on Judah. Um, after the Persians took over Babylon in 539, they continued, or oh, they discouraged really the carrying on of the Babylonian religions. Um, and actually the church that was, or the religious base that was at Babylon, moved to Pergamum. Do you remember Pergamum? Do you remember Pergamum in Revelation? So interesting, isn't it? Um, they moved to Pergamum and they were influential in paganizing the church there. So what happened was the Babylonian religion this, this worship of uh, Tammuz as the mystery child or as the magical child 
and all the stuff of that that, were, that went with them to Pergamum when the Persians took over <coughs> Babylon. Sorry, excuse me. Um, and the end result of it all is that Babylon becomes the symbol of apostasy <coughs> in the church. Excuse me a minute. Mm. There's a lot of information, I'm sorry. It's a lot of information, so it's a bit kind of backwards and forwards, but I want to put this in because I don't think we can understand the judgment of the last days unless we understand the process that brought us to it. Um, Because we can look at our day and we can say, well, yeah, I can see this is bad and that's bad and that's bad, but really, God, really? Are you going to do such devastation? Are you going to do such devastation for just this? And we have that way of, you know, we, we, we always take the side of the underdog. And in some ways that's really good. But in this instance, it's completely wrong. And we have to see this for what it is. We have to see this as the progression of Satan, actually, from the very beginning, taking people away from the true worship of the Lord and people willingly going that way. That's what we have to see, the willingness of people to turn their back on God and walk away. And um, so in the end, the end result of that, as I say, Babylon, when it gets to Pergamum, when that sort of teaching gets to Pergamum, um, they cause the apostasy of the church in Pergamon. Um, and uh, s- they substitute idol worship um, for, uh, for the worship of God. And um, actually, um, in uh, Revelation, we're going to read about the final judgment of Babylon. And the, in, in Revelation 17 and 18, she represents the apostate church in the very, very last days. Um, and the apostate church in the very, very last days is pictured as being in Rome. So Pergamum, when they got when this mystery religion took root and caused the apostasy of the church in Pergamum, that eventually became, that apostasy became the Roman Catholic Church. So I think... <sighs> over the course of the years that I've been teaching here, We've had various people who've come from the Catholic Church here. And sometimes, I mean, they've been lovely people and love the Lord. Um, But to to be able to say to them that the actual tenets of your faith, the, the mission statement, if you like, of your faith, of your church, is heresy, is really, really difficult because we're trying to do that, I was, I'm trying to do it, we were all trying to do it, through a lens of, or through a blanket of comfort and wanting to help and wanting to be kind and wanting to be... And so inevitably we pull back and we don't say things as they really are. But when you follow the history of how the Roman Catholic Church began, go back through and see that it came through Babylon. It came through Babylon. It came through the people who set up Babylon, who set up, who built the tower. It came through that. It came through prostitution of of worship of this fake God, this miracle. I'm sure this son that she had, the wife of Nimrod, did look like a miraculous conception. I'm sure it did have that look to it because Satan is able to imitate anything, anything. And that's what you see he's done. He's imitated even the miraculous birth. Even that birth was in a way, I don't know how it, how it happened, I don't know, but they believed this to be the miracle child that had been promised by God. And so this deception and this, this drawing away, drawing away has been going on. And when you then link that to the Roman Catholic Church, you start to see, wait a minute, wait a minute, this, even though the people within that might be kind and nice and maybe loving and maybe talking as if they're Christians and being Christians, what they are actually following, if they keep to all their rules and regulations, is an apostate church, is a fake church, actually. A fake church, and more so, yeah. So, um, the Babylonian system, philosophy, deception, whatever you want to be, 
call it, has been guilty of persecuting believers, persecuting true believers, ever since Cain killed Abel. It is that strand of going through. And all anti-Christian sects, all of them, even those that call themselves Christians, have killed God's servants over the years. Over the years. They have killed them either physically or spiritually over the years. Um, in the last days, a one world church will be formed. You, 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 we know this, the world church, the harlot in scripture, she's called the harlot, and she'll be involved in the political arena of the world. We're seeing the beginning of that. We're seeing the beginning of that. And with the help of the beast, the Antichrist, the church will become a great power. Imagine how tempting that is to people at the top of these, um, I don't know, I don't want to say denominations, but you know what I mean, the people at the top of these various religions, how appealing that is that they might be a part of a government, and even with the best intentions sometimes, that they might be a part of a government that will be able to save the world. A church that will be instrumental in saving the world. I don't know that I've ever been more sure that Kingdom Now theology, which is the idea that the church will save the world, the church will clean the world up, and then Christ will come. I have never been more sure that that's where we're living now, in this nation, and that the, this, this, this cleaning the world church, or this Kingdom Now theology, is entirely the work of Satan. Entirely the work of Satan. And we do no service to fellow believers by not telling them that. That's the reality. And I know we have to figure out how to tell them, but we have to tell them. Because they are going to become a part of a fake system and go down a fake road, and they will end with the harlot, the harlot who's destroyed in Revelation 17 and 18. Um, in the last days, as I say, the world church will be empowered by or help, will help the beast with the help of the beast and become a great power. Um, and actually, Revelation pictures her riding into power on the back of the beast, so supported by the Antichrist. And uh, many people at this moment believe that that's going to happen within Europe, that's going to start within Europe. Um, the beast will get the support of ten kings. This is all from Revelation. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, describes a union that exists between the nations of Europe, the beast and the world church. And Revelation 17 describes how God will have the victory over this. So Revelation 6, verse 1 and 2. Um, Revelation 6, Then I saw when one of the lambs when I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder, Come, I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So a union between um, the uh, nations of Europe, the beast, and the world church begins in Revelation 6, the description of it begins in Revelation 6, when John is, in, is in, uh, in, in the Spirit in the last day, on the Lord's Day, and he sees this vision, and he's taking us through, through the, the uh, vision he sees in heaven, chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Revelation, and then in chapter 6, things start to happen, because the Lamb, Jesus, breaks the seal that he, uh, John has seen in the hands in the hand of God. And the Lamb takes, the Lamb Jesus Christ takes that seal, breaks the seal, and the first thing that happens is that this white horse goes out, and the one who sits on it has a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So the way of this world church and the world power that supports her in the beginning will be very successful and very powerful. Very successful and very powerful. In the middle of the seven-year tribulation, which uh, Daniel talks about, which the Old Testament talks about, which Revelation talks about in specifics, so in, um, in specific numbers as you go through Revelation, which we'll do in, in part 
backwards and forwards. In the middle of this seven-year tribulation, the beast will want all worship for himself. So what has to happen by then? It has to be that the church, the apostate church, the one world church that the beast has been carrying for that time will have to be destroyed. So all of the people, the real Christians that you know that are part of a, a, a church that is not following Christ, that is apostate, that has gone the wrong way, whether or not, I don't want to think about them as whether they're true believers or not believers, and when the rapture happened and all of that, we'll get into that later. But anyone who is part of that, if the church is still around at the midpoint of the tribulation, those people will be destroyed and it will not be pretty. The one world church will have to be destroyed because at that time, the Antichrist will want all worship to be of him, the Antichrist who is empowered by Satan. He will stand, Genesis, uh, Daniel reads, uh, speaks of it, uh, Jesus quotes from Daniel in Matthew 24, and he says, uh, but in the middle of that time, in the middle of that time, the abomination of desolation will take his stand in the holy place. As Daniel the prophet says, Jesus said, let the reader understand. And he will cause everyone to worship him. That's a paraphrase. But he will cause everyone to worship him. There's no room for a church when a world power stands or a man stands and says, you have to worship me. There's no room for a church. And so the church will be destroyed. So, with the harlot out of the way, the beast declares himself to be God. He is going to demand the worship of all the nations. If you want to read about that, you can read it in Revelation 13, verse 16. Uh, well, actually, all of Revelation 13 would be good to read, but verse 16 says this, And he causes all, the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Sorry, go back to verse 15. Uh, verse 11, actually, I should have read from verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven and to the, to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was, it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And then as, as I just read, and it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as, who, as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So there is worship going on. So um, with the harlot out of the way, with the fake church out of the way, uh, uh, he will declare himself to be God. And he will demand the worship of the nations. So what would be the contrast then? Because that's where we're going to get into with this day of the Lord. What would be the contrasts between a fake church and a true church? The first church is called a harlot. The, the true church is called the bride of Christ. The harlot is in the wilderness in Revelation 17, uh, it, which is where uh, she, we're going to read about her being destroyed. Revelation 17, verse 3, And he carried me away into the spirit, into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names and having seven heads and ten horns. Describing this fake church, this harlot, she's in the wilderness, the bride is in heaven. Revelation 19, verse 4, and Revelation 5, verse 8 to 10, speak of the elders worshipping the thr at the throne of God. So the true church is in heaven, and the fake church is still on earth and in the wilderness. The harlot is adorned by Satan. Chapter 17, verse 4, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of all the unclean things of immorality. The harlot, the fake church, is adorned by Satan, 
And what about the real church? Revelation 19, verse 8. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. These are definite contrasts, complete comparisons and contrasts between what is fake and what is real. The harlot is um, judged forever. The bride exists forever, reigns eternal. The harlot is stained with the blood of the martyrs. The bride is redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. All believers today are to separate themselves from the apostate church. We are all to separate ourselves from Satan's false church and to identify outwardly, openly, vocally with the true church. With the true church. The false church is going to appear to be very successful for a while. But her doom is fixed. And as I say, you do no one any favours if you do not speak of this. If you don't speak of this. <coughs> the theme of separation goes right through scripture. And we're going to follow it in the book of Joel, actually. The book of Joel is actually the condensed story <coughs> of a call to separate to separate, to come out. And, um, <coughs> and he's at the first mention of that day in Joel. He gives a fantastic in insight into what's going to happen in our day, which I think is already beginning. And, um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Uh, turn to Joel, if you turn to Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1. And... Um, I don't know if you've done any, have you done already the first week of that homework or, I don't know. Anyway, so you should know some of this stuff that I'm going to go through. But, um, so if, if, if God wrote through Joel three chapters about a day of the Lord, it's something that we really are going to learn from for our day. It's, um, and although it appears to be about locusts, obviously it has prophetic significance. Um, but of course, it's not just reading and understanding that is what God wants. The thing that he wants most of all is that we apply what we read to our lives. I think actually that's some, a place where Satan's been very successful in the church. I think a lot of people know what the Bible says. They understand even what it means, but they don't apply it to their lives. They don't apply it to their lives personally or to their lives in fellowship. And because they don't, all of this has been able to grow and, you know, like a cancer. It's just grown and grown and spread and spread throughout the whole body. Um, so Joel chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land, has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it and let your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. Basically, not too much is known about Joel. His name means Jehovah is God and um, he's the son of Pethuel, it says here. Um, but it really only leads to another question like who's Pethuel then? <laughs> so we don't know. Um, there's not much about either of them. Joel does mention a still standing Jerusalem um, and the enemies he speaks of sound like those of Judah before the Babylonian captivity. But it, nobody knows that for sure. Nobody knows for sure when he wrote his book. There are lots of different opinions. But I don't really think it matters much because it's the message of Joel that matters the most. And it probably could be read in any generation to any set of people because it is the same message of God. Separate, come out of her, keep your eye on me, keep your eye on me and stand, stand and speak and be for me. You know, be for me. Um, Joel is obviously moved by a great plague of locusts sent as this divine discipline to his people. And he envisions through that a great act of judgment at the end of time. And, um, and which would do two things. It will purify his own people and lead to their national conversion. 
but also will be a terrible time of destruction. And um, he uses so many powerful words and phrases and uh, pictures to show what's going to happen. Um, actually, it's quite distressing, I think, to read it. It's quite distressing to read. Uh, it's distressing to read in the light of what's happening in Israel right now. It's uh, disturbing to think, uh, well, it disturbs how you might naturally pray. It changes the way you might naturally pray and, and causes, you th I think, causes us to, to think about Israel and what's happening there in a different way. Um, and, and changes, I also think, changes the way that I look at my own uh, place in the body and the bride of Christ. Because I'm not now just part of a happy family. I'm not now called to just exercise my spiritual gift within the family of God and to love everyone and, and be kind and uh, offer compassion and comfort and feed the, feed the, you know, feed the hungry, house the poor. I think those days are still here, but they're kind of taking almost a second place to the reality of the day that we live in. That there's more to be done. I think there are many thousands of churches in this land who are very intent on being in the community being in the community, being a witness in the community, being good in the community. And who could possibly say that that's wrong? That's not wrong. That's what we were to do from the moment Jesus was resurrected and the church began at Pentecost. We were supposed to be out in the community, speaking of him, living as he lived, helping as he helped. But now, in, in a way, it's almost like, okay, it's almost like God's saying, right, the locusts are here now. I mean, they're here. And as much as you help with all of that stuff, you have to be making sure that people understand they don't have tomorrow, they have only today. They have only today. And building a house and feeding them and giving them medicine and making their life better and making the life of this nation better and, and other nations, that is not going to happen. We are not able to do that because the Lord will not allow an apostate church, a heretical church, to stand. He will not allow it to stand. So even though it looks like it might be successful for a while, it will fall and its fall will be great. When you read about the fall of Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18, which is essentially the political and the religious system of Babylon, when you read about those two things, you are in, under no illusion that that fall is going to be painful and violent and hard for anyone who is concerned and, and uh, caught up in, in, in that Babylonian system. I, I don't, don't know how else to say it except that I feel like we have these books, like all of these books, 66 books, and pretty much they're all saying the same thing. You know, you're going to walk a narrow way and there's not going to be many people on your way and the, and the people on the side of your way, the people who are not walking your way, they're going to think you're an idiot. Mm -hmm. And they're going to laugh and they're going to say, well, give me proof of this and tell me about that and that's ridiculous and how can that be? And you're going to be bombarded on every side by that scoffing and that mockery and, and also by your own flesh saying, is it really true? Can it really be true? How can this really be happening? Lord, you're so wonderful and good and marvellous and kind. How can that be that you're doing this? You're allowing this. So there's going to be all of this coming at us individually and collectively and we have to be sure A, of who God is and B, of what he says is going to happen. We have to be sure of it. We have to be sure as you read as you read through Joel and you look at everything that he says, you know, and, and you 
maybe at some stage you'll look at a commentary and you'll think, well, okay, well, what do they say? And then somebody will say, well, you know, that was just really a real locust plague and, and Joel just, you know, it was horrible and he said, there might be another one and so you don't have to take too much worry about that because that was, I mean, that was thousands of years ago so we don't have to worry about that. There are believers out there who say that, who write books about it, who are very learned, and, and we, who are we, <laughs> you know, to say, well, that's not right, that can't be right, this must be more than that. But, but the whole idea of what we're going to do and what we're doing and what ha we're always doing here is that we are going to learn for ourselves what this says. And we are going to ask the Lord to give us the wisdom and the understanding to be able to apply it to our everyday life. How do you apply a plague of locusts to your everyday life? I mean, you need a work of God to be able to do that. You need him to be able to, to, to be saying to you, this is that, this is that, and this is this, and this is the way you're going to go through this. Joel, um, as I said, he uses all these powerful phrases, I think, and these um, uh, very definite words about this great act of judgment that's coming at the end of time. And, um, and he describes in the book the blessings that total commitment to God will bring. And when you speak to anyone who has gone, gone through a severe trial or is going through a severe trial, who has turned to God in that trial, I mean, it's unbelievable almost. You can't use that word because we believe, but it is almost unbelievable that that person can know so much about God that they've learned in the tunnel that they've walked through. I, I'm constantly amazed at how the evidence of God's protection and provision and holding preserving through those times. I am constantly amazed at how he does that. And how, and in some ways, I'm envious of that. I want that. I want that understanding, that deep, uh, deep sense of God's presence. But there's still a bit of me that says, but I don't want to go there, Lord. <laughs> I mean, could I do it a bit easier? So I think this idea that, that Joel sets up in me is that he's basically saying, God is saying through him, okay, can you trust me this way? Can you trust me to walk through a dark, dark, dark day knowing that there will be light in your tunnel? There will be glorious light in your tunnel. And we're all called to it. Okay, just a bit of history, which I know you all know, but just for the sake of <coughs> anyone online who may not know it. Um, uh, the nation of Israel um, set up under David and then under his son Solomon, who built the temple, um, uh, split in uh, 722 BC. Solomon died and his son listened to the voices of his friends rather than the voices of the elders in the kingdom and uh, consequently 10 of the tribes, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel went north and two of them, only two of them, Judah and Benjamin, stayed around Jerusalem. And in 722, uh, sorry, didn't split in 722. In 9, 931 BC, they split. But in 722, God sent the Assyrians against the northern kingdom for the idol worship that they had been practicing since 19, 931 BC. What happened was when the t 10 tribes went north, they had a king called Jeroboam, and he was afraid that they would start to trickle back into Judah and Jerusalem. And so he built two places of worship for them. Dan, Dan and in Bethel, and they were encouraged to go and worship 
fake gods, essentially, in, in the Northern Kingdom, and, and most of them did. And some of them went back, filtered back through to Judah and Jerusalem and stayed there. Um, but the, uh, the, the captivity by the Assyrians of the Northern Kingdom was a warning to Judah. It's used whilst that's going on and afterwards as a warning to Judah that I will, God will not tolerate the worship of idols by his people. See, this is what we're talking about in Joel. It's the worship of idols by his people. It's not necessarily all the people who are not his people, all the unbelievers. It's, it's pretty much the judgment of God against his people for going astray and worshipping other gods. Now, I don't think we can take a direct comparison between Israel and, or Judah and the church because the church is made up of, the true church at least, the, the, the real bride of Christ, are people who have put their trust in Jesus and have believed in him. And we have passed through judgment, John chapter 5 tells us, we have passed through judgment into life. So we will not face the judgment of God because that judgment has been paid for in Christ Jesus and we are now in him. So we can't take Joel as a direct, oh gosh, this is what God's going to do to the church or to every single believer. But what we can do is take the principles of it. Joel's, uh, or when, when Israel split and the ten tribes went north, they did not ever have a good king if you read the history of them through Kings and Chronicles, you will see they never had a king described as good. Judah had nine kings described as good. The rest were pretty bad. And all of the time throughout their history, before they went into the captivity in Babylon, God was sending a warning to them through prophet after prophet after prophet to say, repent, repent, turn back to me. And he was doing it in all sorts of different ways, in, by all sorts of different people. But the essential message was, do not keep going astray, repent. It's quite interesting to me that when you get to Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you hear Jesus say the same thing to the church, repent. And you think to yourself, how can that be? This is to the church. But it is obviously because there are people within those churches at that time, in that day, just as there are now and have been through history, there are people who attend those churches who, who are not actually believers. Revelation, well, uh, Ephesians, uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 2, uh, his message to uh, Ephesus is... is is probably the, well, it's the first one and the most clear. Um, uh, but I have this against you, Jesus says in verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. So this idea of repentance is spoken by Jesus to his church. Now, or to the church that is, was in existence in Ephesus at that time. Throughout all the messages to the churches, they've all probably or certainly got individual believers in them. But in those churches, there are also a lot of unbelievers. And he's calling each one. That's why he can say uh, to the church in, um, is it Laodicea, he says it? I, uh, or anyway, I'll find it in a minute. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Outside. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens, I will come in and eat with him. So there's this idea that that church actually probably didn't have anyone in there, really, who was w willing to, to w was actually what we might call a Bible-believing, true believer in Jesus Christ. So, it, Laodicea, yes, that's what I thought. So, so there's this twofold thing going on, really. Um, in Joel, there's this judgment of his people, and within that judgment, there will be those who truly are righteous, who are going to go through the same judgment. I think by the time we get to the New Testament, because Christ took our judgment, because we pass through judgment into life, because he, he took the wrath of God for us, because he did that, we will not necessarily be around at the last moments of this last day of the, the, the great day of the Lord, the great tribulation. I'm not positive, 
but that's pretty much why I think we won't be, is that he took the wrath of God for us. Um, Thessalonians says that, First Thessalonians, um, that he will take us out or take, save us from the wrath of God. For chapter 1, First Thessalonians chapter 1, I think it's verse 10. Um, and then uh, every chapter in First Thessalonians ends with a sort of promise, not necessarily in those words, but that believers, true believers, will not face the wrath of God, will not go through the wrath of God. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not going to have all of the beginning of the, the, the last days, that we're not going to go through all of the trouble that is coming this way. I think we probably will be pretty much, because God is a merciful God, and you are his carrier of mercy. And so he's going to enable us to stand in the days ahead and take us, hopefully, from, the, from before the worst of it. But nonetheless, we are, we are going slowly into that place. And so this idea through, uh, through Israel's history, this call to repentance, repent, 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 to the northern kingdom for years, 200 years, until the Assyrian capture, and then even after that, repent, 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 you know, come back to me, and then into Judah, the, the message, again, uh, this one, uh, and many, many other prophetic messages to the, uh, those who were in Jerusalem and in Judea to repent and come back. So um, Joel had this burden, really, that... Um, was a call to get the people of God to return to God, to return to God. Um, I, you know, I've been in America recently, and um, for a month, actually. It was hard to come home. The sun was shining every day. And um, uh, what was I going to say? Why did I talk about the sun shining? I can't remember. Anyway, it'll come back to me. It'll come back to me sometime. Yeah. No, the church is, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I know, sorry. Thank you for all the help, but it's completely gone. It's completely gone. Um, yeah, it was obviously not important. So, this burden of, of Joel to, or of God, um, to bring his people to repentance has come through all the kings that have come in, into Judah, all of them. It's this call of God to his people to come back to me. And now, honestly, I think he's going to make that call through true believers. Yeah. Repent, come back to me. This is the truth. Walk this way. Um, and, and I think it will be a real blessing to us to be a part of it, but it will be hard. It will be hard. Anyway, so Joel chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in, our, in your days, or anything in your father's days? Tell your sons about it, and let your sons tell their sons, and their sons, the next generation. It's like Joel gets straight to business. Have you ever seen anything like this? Have you ever seen anything like this? And people will say in our day, won't they? They'll say, well, it was like this 50 years ago, 70 years ago, Second World War, it was like this. We've had this before, we've had this, we've had that, you know, before and before. And Joel's almost saying, you know, he's saying, you've not seen anything like this. This is different. This is something else. And he's going to describe, he goes on in this chapter to describe an event that is totally unique. He's saying, you haven't seen this in your day and your fathers didn't see it. This is not something you can say, oh, it's happened before. But it is something that you should teach your children about. You should teach your children and tell them to teach their children and future generations about this because this is an event that has eternal significance. This is an event that is, is more important than anything that you might teach them anywhere else. This is uh, for all future generations to know. And, and actually, we know it because they did that. It was written down. We know about this locust plague that he's going to describe because someone wrote it down. And, um, and what it reminds us of 
is, of course, what um, Daniel speaks about, about this day of the Lord that's coming on the people of Israel. Genesis, um, Daniel chapter 12. Daniel is told by Gabriel, who's come to him right at the end of this book, um, uh, book of Daniel, he's told that there's a day of distress coming such as has never been seen from this day until then. Daniel 12, verse 1. And um, now at that time, this is Gabriel talking. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over your sons, over the sons of your people will arise and there will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And this is what he says in verse 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead many to righteous like the stars forever and ever. This is not... This is Daniel talking about the end time for his people, Israel. This is what Jesus quoted in Matthew 24. Not specifically this verse, but this whole uh, truth that's written down in, in Daniel. He quoted this. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the stars of heaven, and they will lead many to righteousness. That's our job now. That's our job, to lead many to righteousness. Um, and Jeremiah spoke of it the same, the same day that Daniel's talking about, the same time that ja Daniel is talking about. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. <coughs> Jeremiah 30, verse 7. <coughs> Alas, that day is great. There is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. <coughs> and Jesus, as I've said, speaking of it in Matthew 24, saying, For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, um, but he will be saved out of it. Sorry, that's Jeremiah. For then, there, Jesus saying, For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equaled again. That's Matthew 24, verse 21. Knowing this then, what, what we're going to apply to ourselves, you know, I said right at the beginning, we, this is, we can know this stuff, and, it, and I've felt that this is kind of maybe too much detail here, um, and too much, yeah, I don't know, too dry, but I kind of decided, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to preach a message, I'm here to teach what the Bible says, and, you know, that's hard, because I'd like to be nice and jolly and not have a dry throat and come out with all this wonderful, exciting and very assuring stuff. But this is the reality of what we're going into. And, um, and knowing that, what are we going to apply to our lives? What, are we going to ha what, what am I going to do with the truth that there is a day coming, whether I'm here or not, when it comes, when it actually hits, there is a day coming that is unlike any other day this world has ever experienced. That there is a judgment coming that is going to sweep away two-thirds of the world's population are going to die in that judgment. At least two-thirds. That they are going to be burned up in hideous, ter terrible ways that that mankind is, is going to be revealed to be who he is, and that is vicious and wicked and full of evil against his fellow man. That, that man's inhumanity to man is going to be clear and obvious to all. And that this judgment from on high, the judgment of God through the heavens and uh, through things that happen in the heavenly places and things that then happen on earth, famine and death and destruction are going to be so bad that no one is going to be able to say they've seen it before or it was like that or we'll get through it, we'll get through it together, we'll just all band together and we'll make it through, you know, that's not going to happen. So what am I going to do in the knowledge of that Knowing that, 
What am I going to apply to my life? And I, I've got some, you know, questions really. How is your walk with the Lord really? How is your walk with the Lord? I'm asking myself, how's your walk with the Lord? You know, I can spend a lot of time preparing these things. I do spend a lot of time preparing these things. And I can, I can kind of um, tell myself that, I, you know, go come to DC, go to church on a Sunday, you know, send the old text to someone. I'm not very communicative that way, but, you know, send something uplifting, hopefully, to someone. But that's, that's not my walk with the Lord. That's not my walk with the Lord. My walk with the Lord is those intimate moments when I give up my time to actually talk to him and hear him talk to me. And so how is that walk? And then when he talks to me, what am I doing with what he says? What am I doing with what he says? And, you know, all the prayers that I'm sending up, you know, prayers, essentially, are they about me? Are they all about me? Or are they about him? And what does he want for me? And what does he want for me to do and say and be? You know, I'm not saying we don't pray about ourselves. God told us to pray about everything, to come to him with everything. And there are some things we can't handle, many things we can't handle. We have to give them to the Lord and we have to talk to him about them. That's not wrong. But is the emphasis of my life on me or is it on him? You know, I could cheerfully move to Nashville. I mean, I loved that place. I loved it. I loved the churches. I loved the people. I loved the, I don't know, just everything about it. But I can't move to Nashville because I have a family here that don't know the Lord. I have people who are sick and who knows what's going to happen to them. And to move away at that this time would be a, a, a flag of, well, you don't, you don't matter to me. I'm going to go there because you don't matter to me. You know, and, and my neighbours, you know, the village I live in that hardly ever see us and think we've, you know, we've already immigrated some, emigrated somewhere. You know, what am I going to say to them? The people I see in the street, what am I going to say to them? You know, hello, how are you? Yes, I've just been to Nashville. It was so great. Yes, you haven't seen me for a month, but that's where I've been. Bye, have a nice day. What am I going to say? What, am I going to pray for them? This is, what, this is what this is about. This is what Joel is about. Don't think this is about detail. I mean, it is about the details of what's going to happen and the, the, the prophecy of God through Joel to us. But it's so that you and I insignificant as we may feel ourselves to be, are willing to say, okay, Lord, you work this in me and through me so that I can make a difference to whoever I come into contact with, so that he can make that difference through me because I know what they are going to face. I know what they're going to go through. You know, um, so... Uh, you know, how's your walk with the Lord? Um, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 1, he says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. Because of the increase of wickedness in the world, the love of many will grow cold. Well, I don't know about you, but I can read the, the news and I can feel no love for the people that I'm reading about. No love at all. The people that are doing stuff to other people that I just can't even bear to read about and then I'm supposed to love those people. And has my love for God called? I mean, honestly, ask yourself that question. Has your love for God called? Because that's what Jesus said to the church in Ephesus. He said, you're doing great stuff. You're doing great. You know my word. You're teaching my word. You're doing really good stuff. But... but um, You've forgotten, your, you've forsaken your first love. You've forsaken your first love. That's not forgotten or lost, it's you've forsaken it. You have definitely put it down and put other things in its place. Your first love. So, um, how can that be reversed? How can I reverse that forsaking my first love? If I've done it, because this book is a call to, for me to repent, to turn around, to, lay, to, to stop going the way I'm going, and to say, okay, I, 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 that's wrong. I don't want to go that way. 
I don't want to go that way. I want to go your way. I mean, Ephesus must be must have been ranked the best church in that whole area, don't you think? They were doing all these wonderful things. And can you imagine, they, they, Jesus is coming in or sends a messenger to them and, and it, you know, they're all there sitting in their Sunday best and they're thinking, well, we're doing a great job, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're building houses, we're doing this, we're blah, 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 we're in the community. Oh, it's just all wonderful and we're wonderful and we love each other and we pray for each other and isn't it wonderful? And then Jesus comes in and he says, you've forsaken your first love and can you imagine they're going to be knocked back in their seats? What do you mean? I've got my Bible. I'm coming every Sunday. I'm in a small group on a Wednesday night. I'm giving my money here and giving my money. What do you mean I've forsaken my first love? And that's his, that's his thing. You've forsaken your first love. Repent. Repent. I don't know if I've forsaken my first love. I don't think I have, but I'm definitely going to sit and ask the Lord if I have. I'm going to apply that to myself and say, have I forsaken my first love? Have I let it be covered by too many other loves. Repent and do the things you did at first. What were the things you did at first? You know, what did you do when your relationship with Jesus was new? What did you do then? When you were a baby Christian, when you knew nothing but thought you knew everything and suddenly the world was alive to you and you just, yeah, what did you do then? How, how did you, you know, do you still do those things? I mean, I told you many times, I went to church that I had walked up in church and given my life to the Lord, didn't even know what I was doing when I did it, so thankfully someone got hold of me. And she took me to a meeting and there was Kay Arthur at the top, you know, started Precept Ministries in her 90s now. And uh, she just opened this Bible up to First John. And I can't tell you, I mean, I was weeping hearing her and all I could think was oh god I want that I want that I don't listen to people now very much maybe I need to I want that I want the love that she has for you and I want the knowledge of your word that she has in her head and in her heart. And I want the power to speak it like that. I want to be able to live a life that is totally and utterly sold out for you. Now, Kay Arthur's an ordinary human being, but she was on fire for the Lord when I knew her then. What would you need to change in your life to do the things you did at first? What would need to change? Because Joel says... Total devastation is coming. Here, verse 4, Joel chapter 1. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. There is a plague coming. There are disaster, there's disaster coming. Disaster coming. What were you doing at first that you might need to go back to? Or maybe you're still doing those things that you were doing at first, and maybe you're doing better than you were doing at first, but could you do better than you're doing? Could you, could you love him more? Could you give him more of your time? You know, uh, Joel says there's this locust invasion that's going to destroy everything. He uses four terms to describe the locusts here. He uses swarms, great locusts, young locusts, and other locusts, he uses. And there would be four phases of locusts that would completely and utterly devastate the land. And I think that that's interesting. Four different stages, plagues of locusts that would totally devastate the land. It's interesting to me because in Revelation chapter 6, there are four horsemen who start four different things. And in Revelation chapter 6, and then in, in Daniel, sorry, in so we'll go to Revelation chapter 6, but we'll talk about Daniel on the way because in Daniel, 
what we read about are four empires that are going to affect Israel. So there are four plagues of locusts in Joel. There are four empires that are going to massively impact Israel in, in her history. And then in Revelation, there are four horsemen of the apocalypse that are going to be sent out when the seals are broken on the scroll uh, by the Lamb. So um, the four empires, I don't know if you remember them, but the first is the Babylonian Empire, which we have been talking about. Um, Babylonian Empire, then the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. They are the four uh, empires that are described in Daniel as affecting Israel. Obviously, there were loads of other world empires. I remember a Japanese friend of mine, I was teaching Daniel in Tokyo, and she said to me, well, sorry, I, I don't quite get this, Sam, because you say there are four empires in the world, but, you know, what about the Ming dynasty and, and the, this, this thing, because she was Japanese? And I said, I didn't really quite... It, was, it knocked me back because I'd never had that question before, and I was fairly new anyway to teaching. And it suddenly dawned on me, oh, 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 I said, I know what it is, Michiko. It's that these empires affect Israel. These empires affect Israel. And, you know... Uh, anyway, so the four locust plagues, I think you can relate them to the four empires that will come against Israel or enslave I Israel. I think that you can relate them to the four horsemen of the apocalypse who are going to bring total devastation upon the land. Um, Revelation 6, verse 1 to 8, talk about the four horsemen and what they're going to do. Um, then I saw that when the lamb broke one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder come, I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come, and another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men would slay one another and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the living creature saying, Come, I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Um, when the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come, I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. A fourth of the earth is, I think we're up to nine billion now. It was eight billion. So a fourth of the earth is two and something billion people billion people. <laughs> Going back to Joel, Joel is telling them he is, he is using this locust uh, invasion to tell them, you know, you've got to do something. So how do they respond? Joel, verse 5, Awake, he says, drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you wine drinkers, on account of the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has made my vine a waste, and my fig tree splinters. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white. Wail like a virgin, girded with sackcloth, for the bridegroom of her youth." Wail, for the, the grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The field is ruined, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined. The new wine dries up, fresh oil fails. Be ashamed, O farmers, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine dries up and the fig tree fails. The pomegranate, the palm also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field dry up. Indeed, rejoicing dries up from the sons of men. All areas of society will be affected by the devastation of the locust 
plague. The grieving will be great in Judah. There will be immense sorrow. Uh, the drunkards are told to wake, wake up and weep. Um, the entire nation, including the priests, are told to mourn. And nothing will be left in the aftermath of the locusts. The fields, the ground, the grain, the new wine, the, the wheat and the barley, the vine, and everything will be destroyed. And due to the destruction and the coming famine, the passage ends with this um, grim reality that surely um, the rejoicing dries up from the sons of men. There's no rejoicing. Um, the third horseman that we read about in Revelation 6 brings about a similar thing. It brings about famine, pair of scales in his hands, talking about uh, the need to measure and ration food. That's coming. Uh, a um, denarius was the normal day's wage that would be needed. And a quart of wheat was needed to sustain a person for one day. Um, all famine is associated with the coming of the Lord. A person's going to work all day and have just enough to buy food for one person. That's what Revelation says. Just enough to buy one person. I mean, many countries in the world are already experiencing this. We're not, but they are. But we'll soon be experiencing this. We'll soon be experiencing it. So, uh, this, I've got more questions, you know, that I'm asking myself. How strong is my foundation? How strong is your foundation? Does your joy consist of the things that you have? Is, is that where your joy is? Because you have things. Because you can pay your electricity bill. Because you have a roof over your head. Because the, the voice, go, the, the call goes out in Joel to awake wake up because this is going to happen and I don't want to speaking personally I don't want to believe this I do not want to believe this is going to happen in my day do you you don't want to believe this I don't want to believe a famine is coming I don't want to believe that this is going to happen that that two two point whatever billion people are going to die. And this is just at the beginning of the tribulation. This is not at the midpoint or the end. This is just at the beginning. And can you imagine the horror? Two billion people suffering famine and starvation and, and, and death and suffering and all that attends it. And I'm going to have to be asking myself as I go through this study, what effect is this having on me? Knowing this. Am I just going to go out of the door when I leave here and go and have lunch and, you know, enjoy myself, go home to my husband, and, you know, and, and just get on with my life? And, or, or what am I going to do with this information? Because you and I, we've been studying a long time. I was counting up the years we've been in this place, just in this place. Um, we've been here a long time. Desiring Truth has been going for, it'll be 15 years next year. We've been here in Sirencester since 2015, December 2015. We've had hundreds of people come through the door and go out and come through the door and go out. Hundreds of people. More than hundreds maybe, I don't know, in that time. Loads and loads of people. How are they living? You know, what are they doing? We're a Bible teaching place. This is what we do. We're not a church, so I don't know what you do. Thursday, uh, Wednesday through next Monday. I don't know. I don't know how your life is lived. I know what you tell me, but I don't, I'm not with you all the time. But God is with you all the time. He knows how your life is lived. He knows how my life is lived. And I don't want to go through, Joel, of all the studies we've ever done and all the things we've looked at and all the ways we've talked about Scripture and filled ourselves with the assurance of our salvation, all of that... I don't want to go through Joel and not be changed by what I read. I, don't, I want my life to be changed by what I read in Joel because I think that we are at the end. We are at the end. And we can keep saying that and keep saying it and carry it on our lives as if, it does, you know, as if everything's the same or we can decide we're at the end. Let's do something. I, I said the call in Joel is wake up. 
and loads of the New Testament writers say the same thing. And so I'll just finish with this um, for now. Mark 13, um, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. Um, Let's go there. We'll go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. Um, Sorry, let's get there. 1 Peter chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. I mean, really, do you, I, I can't, I don't want to even read that. I don't want to read that. Since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In this, in all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give account. They will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. The end of all things is near. Therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so <coughs> Excuse me, as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as the one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. <coughs> so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. <coughs> to him whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. <coughs> Amen. Amen. I've got to stop, haven't I? I've got to stop. <coughs> Father, I, I don't, yeah, I'm going to stop, Lord, because I can't speak anymore.